OK, welcome back. Uh, CS 4510, uh, sixth lecture, uh, second half. And today we're going to talk, we just finished talking about the pushdown automata. We talked about, you know, we gave an NFA, this non deterministic computer. We gave it access to a data structure. So it has more than, like, a, more than the memory that it's uh, born with. Like, if you think of an NFA, it has only finitely many states, it can keep track of finitely many things. A PDA, is an NFA, but now it has a stack that it can use arbitrarily to arbitrarily depth. It can do a lot of things with the stack. Um, certainly more than it could do with its states. But we're trying to now measure how much more power does this actually give it. So before we get really into the, into the details of it, let's go kind of like, uh, like a high level picture of what we've done so far and how do these two things relate. So we have, uh, we started first with the DFAs, so we have LDFA. And then we were able to prove that these were all equivalent to the NFAs. And then we were also able to prove that those were equivalent to the regular expressions. So those are our first three models. And we proved that these are all the same. So anything that is decidable by a DFA is decidable by an NFA and a regular expression and so on. These are basically interchangeable. And then we used the pumping limit to prove that there were some languages which were not, um, not regular. So these are the regular languages. Uh, we called, and then we were able to show that these languages which were not regular were decidable by um, context-free grammars. So these are the context-free grammars. Recall that the moral here is that we're trying to build like an ideal model of a computer. So something that is decidable like naturally to us, like we say the, see the language a to the n, b to the n, obviously I can write an algorithm for it. So then, like, because there isn't a DFA for something I can obviously write an algorithm for, the DFA is a weak and limited model of a computer. It doesn't capture our intuitive notion of what computation is. So we've tried context-free grammars. Um, we showed that a lot of the things that we could not decide uh, using um, DFAs and NFAs, turns out you could build context-free grammars for. Those were things like A to the N, B to the N. Uh, WWR, but we also mentioned that there were things that were not context-free. There did exist things outside the system, so the context-free grammars, although unnatural and not obvious why they weren't uh, a good model of computation, there are things, and we'll prove it later on, uh, next lecture actually, that there are, there do exist, the only these languages that we've mentioned, they, there do not exist context-free grammars for them as well. So today, this is sort of the picture uh, of our universe so far, of everything that we know, where this is like a Venn diagram of the class of languages that, uh, of the classes, at least I should say, the two classes of languages that we know uh, and their relationship. We know that every context-free grammar, every regular grammar, excuse me, every regular language is also context-free. We prove that using uh, many ways, uh, we, with using regular expressions and regular grammars and so on. Um, now, what about the PDAs? Like, so we let L, fancy L PDA, uh, equal the language is decidable by PDAs. So we gave some PDAs, just like you can talk about simulations and things, but first you can just talk about like power. We gave some, D D some PDAs for A to the N, B to the N, and WWR. Right? So there appears to be some overlap, at least, with the context-free grammars. If you had to guess, what would you say the relationship is between uh, the PDAs and the regular languages? PDAs is a superset. Why? Um, OK, so anything, a PDA is just an NFA with a stack. So anything an NFA can do, a PDA can do. So it can decide all languages. And then it can decide on non-regular languages, as we, as we have seen. So it can do anything an NFA can do and more. OK, yeah. The idea, the, 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 the way I would have worded that is like, it is true that the NFA is a PDA with a stack. So PDA is an NFA with a stack. So anything an NFA can do, a PDA can do. And the PDA for the corresponding NFA just ignores its, it ignores its stack. Right? So like if you had in an NFA, um, if you had transitions of the form, let's do it slightly formally, transitions of the form like A, you go from QI to QJ with an A, when you see an A, 
what you do for your PDA simulation is uh, you go from QI, so you copy the states, you copy the final states, you copy the accept states, and so on. QJ. Um, you read an A off the input, ignore the stack, pop nothing from the stack, push nothing from the stack. So it's really just making a mess of the syntax. You just add a bunch of epsilon, epsilons everywhere. Somehow your NFA is now a PDA. Congrats, the behavior is identical, right? Whatever sequence of states the word visit is on the computation of NFA, it analogously visits the same set of states on the computation this way. Um, the thing with this is that the PDs we've given are also kind of straight line programs. They're mostly straight looking. Like you push the canary, you pop the canary, and so on. Uh, the NFAs we've given are kind of messy and a lot of crossing going on and a lot of loops and so on. So it's, it might not have been obvious like the full power of what the NFAs can do because we've only looked at it a subset of the things that, that's possible with them. Um, if I were to write this like functionally, so like the NFA transition function, we go, we're at some QI, we see symbol A, and we go to Q, QJ or the set containing QJ, right? We'll just say QJ but it would be whatever the sets containing QJ are. Here, we would, uh, for the PDA, we would be a QI, uh, read nothing off the stack, and then we have to go to the pair of what we see and what we read, uh, what state we would be at and what we would write, excuse me, to the stack. So this would be the pair Q, Q, uh, J, Right. So, identically, the the uh, oh, this kind of looks like an avocado. Just notice that. But the 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 regular languages certainly are all uh, decidable by push down automata by converting any NFA to a push down automata. However, there are things that do use the stack. So certainly, not every um, certainly the PDAs are not equal though to the regular languages, right? Because we've shown languages that we've proven are not regular using the pumping lemma that happen to also be decidable by PDA. So they're not going to, we're not going to add a fourth thing here that makes them equivalent, and we're not going to be able to conclude the stack gives no power. Clearly, the stack gives measurable power by this, by this proof. We've proven every NFA has a PDA, and we've proven that there are languages decidable by PDAs which are not decidable by NFAs. So already, that, the relationship between uh, the regular languages and the PDAs is then solved. So let's ask the next question. What is the relationship between the PDAs and our next class, the context-free grammars? So we've given, we've given actually specific PDAs for languages which also we gave grammars for. So the intersection is non-empty, right? It's not like PDAs are this other thing. If you had to guess the relationship between the CFGs and the PDAs, what would you say? This is not intuitive at all, but I, wanna, I just want to hear postulating, like what do you think the relationship is between the PDAs and the CFGs? They're equal. They're equal. Why? Unless you looked at the title of the notes. Then, okay, so because the title is the, the title of the notes is proving they're equal. So if you had to, if you had, if you have some intuition about why they're equal, what would you say that? I'm genuinely curious. It's kind of an open-ended. I felt like with NFAs and regular expressions, they were kind of similar. It was just kind of different formats of the same thing. And I'm guessing that this is kind of the same thing, where instead it's instead of NFAs and regular expressions, it's CFAs and PDAs. Okay. I, I think that's a that's a good answer. Personally, I would have not thought this, like just from understanding it. Like if you think of what is the grammar for like A to the N, B to the N? When you think of a grammar like this, when it, what it does is it like uh, it pushes A's to the left and it pushes B's to the right when you produce several copies of the string. That's kind of like a stack, but this is like two stacks. We won't, we'll prove it later, but two stacks is actually more powerful than one stack. But two stacks seems very different than one stack. But this isn't two stacks. This is like a stack that you can. A context-free grammar cannot delete anything. Every time it's produced a terminal, it can't go back and erase a terminal from its working string. It has to like keep that always has to be there. It can just produce more terminals. It can't undo anything it's done. So this is like a stack that you can't undo, sort of, so to speak. 
So it's very, it, it's not two stacks. It's really exactly the power of one stack. Um, it turns out that this proof is insanely complicated, actually. So what, but by this proof, what I mean is um, we're going to prove that uh, the, today at least, we'll prove that every uh, CFG has a PDA. That's the topic of, of this uh, lecture. So we're going to give a P, given a C of G as a description, as a set of rules. We're going to produce a grammar, excuse me, produce a, a PDA to perform the same behavior as the grammar. The problem is actually the reverse proof. So a PDA is a program. Everyone has done programming. Everyone understands how to write code. Writing PDAs is natural and intuitive. Grammars are not really natural and intuitive. They're kind of just seems like made up rules. They appear from nothing. Somehow the string just magically it, you put some push some buttons and then it, it's there. You know, it, the it's from the outside in instead of left to right, right? Um, right. So like converting a grammar to a PDA is not hard because what you're really going to do is have a hard coded PDA to simulate the productions of the grammar. That's kind of not hard to do because you can just write a program for it. Imagine I asked you to write a program to produce strings of the grammar using a stack. It might be difficult, but it's not impossible, perhaps. But if I asked you to give a grammar to simulate a PDA, so the reverse inclusion, uh, which we won't do today, we'll do next time. But if I asked you, given a PDA, let's just think about this for a second, because it's not obvious. Given a PDA, produce a grammar that simulates the PDA. How do you do that? That proof is very involved, and that's going to take a full lecture. This proof that the PDA, we're going to, that, we're going to, given a CFG, we're going to build a PDA. That's our topic for today. Next time, we'll, given a PDA, we're going to build a CFG. That is much harder, because a grammar is not a program. So somehow you have a program, a PDA. You're going to try to give a grammar that produces the strings the PDA does. That is not easy to do, and that proof is far more involved. Um, but today, at least, we get to do the easy part. We're just going to give it a grammar. We're going to construct a program um, to simulate the, 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 the PDA. It's actually really convenient for us that the, uh, both the grammar and the uh, PDA are non-deterministic because we can make their non-determinism like wavelengths line up. So like the non-deterministic PDA, the non-deterministic action is going to simulate exactly the non-deterministic productions of the grammar. That's what's going to happen today. Any questions before we begin on the, the idea? OK, that's just setting out the goals of, we need to, of what we're going to do today. Um, so before we get, do this, let's do two quick uh, uh, shorthand things. When, as we produce strings in a grammar, we have a sequence of working strings, right? So we like, let's say we did this grammar, we would have s goes to A, S, B, goes to A, A, S, B, B, goes to A, 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 S, B, 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 and so on, right? So there's a sequence of what are called working strings. When you produce the grammar. So we want to kind of, we want to simulate somehow the action of going from one working string to the next. And which working string you go to to the next working string is depend, dependent upon like what non-deterministic choices you make. Like if there's more than one non-terminal left, you have you non-deterministically choose which one you do. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes your non-determinism is forced to be deterministic. So here there's only one terminal, so you have to excuse me one non-terminal. So you have you're, you're forced to make that to produce that one non-terminal until you decide not to until you decide to take that rule. So what we want to do is simulate the transition between like one working string to the next working string. The problem is the PDA has a stack. So like you can't use it like an array or something where you can like read into the thing. And the answer is you're going to use in tandem the stack and the input combined for the uh, PDA. So like this would be like some sequence of working strings for our grammar. Let's say we had a PDA. This is like our PDA, beep boop. Right? Somehow it has its on its input, like uh, let's say a a a b b b, and somehow on the stack, uh, it's going to have something. 
But if we had working string like, let's say, uh, A, A, S, B, B, somehow this was like the current working string, what we're going to do is match prefixes of the working string that are all terminals to parts of the input so far. So we're going to have our PDA like advance the input if the working string if the top if the working string is not if it contains a prefix of terminals. So like if this A is in the working string, okay, imagine this is a working string, so some intermediary string to produce a word. Whatever string produced has to start with an A. We can't delete this A. So the, whatever string we produce is going to start with an A. Guaranteed. Period. So what we do is we match the A in the working string to the A in the input. And then we, we pair those up and then uh, we continue. Then we keep from the first non-terminal onward, we keep that on the stack. And we then hope that that production, what that will eventually produce, matches the rest of the input. So in this example, this would be SVB. So now the top of the stack contains a non-terminal. We've matched two A's in the input to the two A's in the working string, right? So this goes on the stack. This goes on the input. That's the idea of our, we've broken up the working string into two pieces. One is going to stay on the stack, and one is going to stay on the input. And that's the way we, we, we've matched it. Now, um, how is the non-deterministic production going to work here? Like, how do we continue? Basically, what happens is the, the, the PDA gets to have some non-deterministic choices. The grammar gets some non-deterministic choices. We want those to line up. So basically, the way they're going to line up is it's going to pop the non-terminal on the stack and push its production. The production it chooses to push onto the stack is going to be the... The non, it's going to non-deterministically non choose which production to push onto the stack. The, non the, the co choice corresponding to the non-deterministic production it chooses to push onto the stack corresponds to the grammar making that non-deterministic choice of which production to do, whether it chooses to do this rule first or this rule or so on, right? The grammar has a sequence of non-deterministic choices. The PDA is going to be able to make those exact same non-deterministic choices. The choices it makes will correspond exactly to um, the choices the grammar uh, was allowed to make. Before we go on to the formal argument, I want to introduce some shorthand uh, just to make things kind of simpler because if we, the Sipser book kind of keeps this long because it doesn't want to do the shorthand, but I'd rather introduce a shorthand just to make things easier. So the transition function as defined for a, a, a PDA is what? You go from a single state, you go from anything on the input or not, you choose to read the input or not, Um, you choose to read the stack or not. Then you go to a set of state, a set of state uh, symbol pairs. where you go to a new state, and then you can optionally choose to write a symbol onto the stack. That is what we've defined the transition function for a PDA to be. I claim we can actually uh, modify the transition function to be slightly more general in a way that doesn't give the PDA more power. And what we do here is we read, we, uh, excuse me, re read from the input, pop, push, what we're going to do is read from the input, pop, and then push a string. Um, what that means is instead of allowing ourselves to push a single symbol, we allow ourselves to push a string of symbols. That's all we're going to do. We could equivalently allow ourselves to pop a string of symbols, but what happens if you only read half the string or something? Maybe you're stuck somewhere. Turns out that slightly, there's a slight complication with that, and we don't need it. This one is more, far more useful than reading a string of symbols off the, input, off the stack. You can just write a string of symbols to the stack, push it to the stack. Um, the way we're going to do this is actually surprisingly... 
surprisingly easy, like deviously easy. We're going to say, like, given, suppose we had a transition like uh, read A, uh, pop B, push uh, W1, W2, the WN. Suppose this was a transition. Right? So before w1 to wn would just be a symbol of length 1. Now I'm supposing it's an arbitrarily long string. We can convert this subpart of a D, this transition of a PDA to a PDA that only pushes strings of length 1, single symbols. How would we do that? What do you think? Yeah. You just um, do epsilon, epsilon. I forgot what the order was. I think it was read, pop, push. Read from input, pop from stack, push to stack, yeah. Yeah, so you do epsilon, epsilon, and then whatever you want to push, and then you just keep doing that? Yeah, kind of. Like, to use more words, what we're going to do is just add a bunch of dummy states. We're going to read from the input, read from the stack, push uh, wn, and then from here we add a bunch of dummies. Read nothing, read nothing, excuse me, yeah, read nothing, read nothing, push w and minus 1, right? Read nothing, read nothing, w1, right? So it's important here that the symbols go in the opposite order as well, because we want the last thing on the top of the stack to be, uh, the, the, thing, the thing on the top of the stack is the last thing you pushed. So the top of the stack, uh, is uh, w1. Now this is just a convention when we allow ourselves to push multiple strings onto the stack. But it's, we have to just choose which way we're pushing it. So I'm saying we push a string onto, this, onto the stack such that the last thing we push was the first symbol, just for convention. So we're going to push w1 to wn in reverse order. You can do this, right? You can convert any PDA. If you have a PDA like this, you convert this to a normal PDA by adding a bunch of dummy states. It doesn't really matter how many states you have. Finitely many is, is sufficient. So every time you see a transition like that, you can convert it to a normal transition. So why not allow yourself to uh, push more than one string onto the stack? That's fine. Now the reason um, I care about this rule is it generalizes amazingly. Like when we're trying to we're trying to prove that every CFG uh, has a PDA. That's the goal for today. So we would write this is every uh, CFG has a PDA. Uh, it turns out when you allow this rule, you get an even stronger, simpler version of it. Every CFG has a PDA with three, with three states. So not only can you convert any CFG to a PDA, you only need three states, it turns out, to convert any, any CFG to a PDA. Every CFG, when you convert the CFG to a PDA, it, this PDA is going to look like the PDA we gave for the Dick language, where you need a start state, you need one accept state, and you're going to, your transitions between the first, second, and third are going to just be uh, pushing and popping that canary, the dollar sign, and then everything else is a self loop. That, it turns out that's how easy, uh, that's how easy this is when you allow this uh, generalization. So let me just give you the actual um, the conversion process, and then we'll do an example. So given a grammar of rules, well, I'll, just draw, I'll, I'll just draw the PDA, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to read nothing off the input, pop nothing, and then push the canary, have a, self, have a state, read nothing off the input, uh, pop the canary, and push nothing, and accept.
have a really big self loop like that. And what you're going to do basically like anytime you see an A on the input and an A on the top of the stack that matches, you just pop the A. Uh, and this is for all A in uh, sigma. So basically, if there's a symbol on the top of the stack that matches the symbol in the input, you pop them. And uh, basically, if uh, when you not if if there's a non-terminal a at the top of the stack, you're going to push its production uh, for productions. So for all productions. Right, so if A goes to W is a production, you're going to push the non-terminal, you're going to pop the non-terminal and push its production for every possible production. That's it. Right? Eventually, if this machine, if the stack is empty at some point, it has produced the words and popped all the string off to match the input. So therefore, the input would be something that could be produced by the grammar. That's what that means. This is this is it. That's, that's okay. That's I mean that's done. We just converted every CFG to a PDA. Um, if we didn't have this shorthand rule, this this part would be slightly challenging. This would be kind of messy. Actually, you would have many. You would have basically several loops. Each one has has several states. Um, any questions on this before I just give you the example? This is a simple, very simple PDA. It turns out. So let's say my grammar was like uh, a to the m, b to the n. Uh, m is greater than or equal to n. So this is really like a's and b's are matching, but then there's more a's. So it's really like a star, a to the n, b to the n, if you think about it, where this star is zero or more. So n plus 0 or more is going to be m, which is greater than n, right? So that's really what this language looks like. How would I make a grammar for this? Well, I would do like uh, s goes to, let's say, like a, t. a is just going to produce a's for me, or no a's. Uh, t is going to be like um, a, the n, b, the n. So this is going to be a, t, b, or epsilon. Does this produce the empty string? Yes. OK. So now I have this grammar. I want to convert this grammar into a PDA. How would I do that? I'm just going to follow the rules uh, as I've written them. So I'm going to, oh, here, we want to at least start with the start symbol, right? So this it would not just be the canary, but it would be S canary. Right? You want to, the first action you're going to do is pop the start symbol push a production of the start symbol, because when, when you follow the rules of the context of grammar, the first thing you do, the first production you ever do is going to be from the start symbol, right? So the way we're going to do this is exactly as we said. We're going to have um, start state. We see, pop nothing off the input, uh, excuse me, read nothing off the in input, pop nothing off the stack, push s uh, canary. So now the stack contains s canary with s on the top. The last thing we want to do is pop the canary. So read nothing off the input, pop the canary, push nothing. Now if we see an a in the input, uh, we want to pop it off the stack. If we see an a input a in the stack, we want to pop it. If we see a B in the input and a B on the stack, we want to pop it. If we, see, if we don't, if we see an S on the top of the stack, we want to not touch the input and push its productions. So what does that look like? S goes to uh, AT, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, if we see an A on the top of the stack, we want to push its production, so that would be little a, big A, or a. So here are two different transitions if we see an A at the top of the stack. Which one we would choose corresponds non-deterministically to which production 
uh, here we would choose? Do we choose to add A's? And then that in turn corresponds to the number of A's, the, the amount that M is greater than N. That's exactly what that corresponds to. How many times do you take this, would you take this transition before you take this one, for example? Um, and then we have one more, we need T. So we have T goes to ATB or T goes to epsilon. Now, just to make things That's the biggest self loop you can draw. That is the PDA for this exact um, this exact grammar. Um, it might be unconvincing until we until we actually perform an execution on it. So we're going to now write uh, perform the computation. But any questions on this example before we do any any loose ends? Yes. What exactly does E E Sorry, epsilon, epsilon. Um, S dollar sign yeah. mean? Read nothing off the input, pop nothing off the stack, push S dollar sign, and with the notation we just defined here, that means the top of the stack is going to be an S. So just to, let's just do the computation actually. So let's say let's say we want to say test like A A B, right? So we want to check if that's in the language. This PDA, this this string is in the is produced by this grammar. It should also be accepted by this PDA. And it turns out the exact computation, the exact productions that the grammar produces the string with, it's going to follow those productions when the PDA, which is simulating the grammar basically, is going to accept that string. So the way we're going to do it is I'll do it like this. I'll say the input is like this, A, A, B. And the stack is eventually, it's originally nothing. But let's suppose that it, I already followed this transition. So the stack is going to contain the S and a dollar sign. The top of the stack is S, okay? We've now moved to this state. And we have not read any of the input yet. Uh, what can I do? What transition does that get to? Um, really, this one. That's the only one, right? The only one that has S as the top of the... I can't take any of these, or you can suppose I take them and non-deterministically reject them. But if, if, if the top of the stack doesn't contain an S, I can't take those transitions. I only take the ones with the S. So I see the S at the top of the stack. I pop it and I push AT, but I don't read anything off the input. So I take this one once. Right. What that means is my computation is now going to look like this. So I popped S off the top stack, and I pushed AT. That makes sense? Now, what are the next transitions I can do? Well, top of the stack, the only one I can do is these two, one of these two. So non-deterministically, I know, like, if I did this one, that would be a rejecting computation path. I'm only concerned if there exists an accepting one. So I'm just going to, like, use my premonition and know that I have to take this one. So I'm going to take this transition next. And that's going to give me... So I pop the A, and I push lowercase a, uppercase a. So it's going to be lowercase a, uppercase a, t, uh, dollar sign, right? So I pop the A, push little a, big A, right? T is still there. Now what transitions I can take? These are the only transitions that have, uh, this is the only transition with, an, with a little a, uh, on the top of the stack. So I have to take that one, and that forces me to read something off the input because there's no transition with epsilon here. So I'm forced to read that one on the input. So basically, I pop this off the stack, and I advance the input. So that one was there. I could erase it, but it doesn't matter, right? This is now the uh, configuration of the machine. Configuration, I just mean like a snapshot of its computation, like what it looks like during the process. Um, so I took this one third. Uh, I'm going to now see an A on the top of the stack, and I know that I'm done with the extra A's. Like, I know that. The machine may not know that and may 
have some implicit rejections to go through. But we're trying to find the one computation path that it accepts. So I know now that I need to take this A goes to epsilon roll. So what that really just means is I read nothing off the input, uh, read A on the top of the stack, pop it, pop it off the top of the stack, and push nothing. So I just pop it. Right. So now T is the top of the stack. I have to choose between these two. I'm going to choose the first one. So pop T, push the production, which is ATB. And the dollar sign is still there. So it's going to be lowercase a, uppercase t, lowercase b, dollar sign. Right? Well, look at that. The top of the stack contains an a. The next input contains an a, both lowercase. I have to apply this rule. So I pop this A, and I'm left with what? TB, dollar sign. You may be able to do this faster in your head. Obviously, I'm going real methodical, making sure nothing's missing. Uh, well, now the, now the rule is like this T is here. I'm going to choose to ep take this, this transition. So that was 6. This is going to be 7. Right? Now I see a B in the input, and I see a B at the top of the stack. I'm going to take this one as 8. Stack is, uh, only has the canary left. I'm out of the input. The only transition I can take then is actually not these, but this one. This one is going to be 9. Actually, I think I'm off by 1 because I didn't count the first transition, but you guys get it, right? And this one is just going to be A, A, B. Out of input. Stack is empty. And I accept. Right. So that's kind of, you can kind of see during the computation path what the stack looks like, right? I pop, I start with S. Pop it, push AT. Pop it, push lowercase a, uppercase a, which corresponds to this AA here. I, then I just ignore the, the, the whatever the prefix is already calculated, right? Notice that if this was like ABB or something, this A might not match with the A we need, so that would reject, right? So we only advance through the input if the prefix of the working string is exactly what we want it to be. So we pop this A off, match it to this A. I have AT on the top of the stack. I just non-deterministically pop the A off. I don't need it. I see T. I pop T. I push ATB. Right? So pop T, push ATB, match the A to the A, got rid of those, advance the input. Now I have TB. Now I'm just non-deterministically popping the T. I have now just B, and I match the B and the B, and so on. Right? So you guys perhaps can believe that this exact construction uh, is possible for any CFG. Yes? Why is there only a b in the second rectangle? How do you decide when to advance? The advancement can only happen. Look at the rules. So all these have epsilon in the read input. There's only two rules that have that don't have epsilon. So to advance through the input, you need to have one of these transitions, and that can only happen when the top of the stack is also an a. Right. Right. So here, a in the input, a in the stack, pop it. Right. So you only pop it when they match. It, 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 the, it's important that they're conditional here. Like, it, you only pop the a if there was an a in the input. Like those are tied together. It's, that's the conditional there. So here, a is top of the stack. A is in the input. You pop the a and advance it. So you pop. Not only do you pop the a, but you advance the input. 
So you could, I could have even erased these and been like, okay, we, we're done looking at those. We don't need to see, this, see those anymore. Just does this, what's on the stack currently, non-deterministically produce the rest of the string that we haven't matched? You know, because once you've fit, fixed some things in the, in the working strings of a context-free grammar, those are done. You can't unproduce those. So just don't even look at them. Ignore them. Just worry if the rest of the thing can be produced by uh, what, what's on the stack currently. Right. So if you read an epsilon, you don't advance? If you read an epsilon, so the input should never have an epsilon. But there are epsilon right. rules allowed through CFGs, and those would work out just fine, right? Like we took this rule and this rule. We just popped it off the stack non-deterministically. Yeah. Right. So this grammar, so the, the reason this is also kind of interesting is that a grammar, is, a grammar and an automata are different. An automata is a decider. It says yes or no. It's the job of the automata. It takes us input, and it's like a program. Like, you can read things. It says yes, no, right? It loops over it. But the grammar has to non-deterministically produce things from the inside out, right? Somehow, it doesn't begin with any input. It just starts with a start symbol. Through the sequence of choices, you end up with a string, right? So somehow, the, the, the PDA has to simulate the grammar, but looking at its own, but it has to take on the input and match it to that at the same time, right? So that's what makes this uh, kind of interesting, I think. You know, these are very two different very types of computers, very different. It's even maybe a misnomer to call a context-free grammar a computer, um, except maybe on accident, right? It's a, it's a producing device. Uh, yet these two uh, have this relationship. So just to clarify what, we, what we've just proven, we've proven that if a language is decidable by a context-free grammar, then it is decidable, excuse me, if a, grammar, if a language is produced by a context-free grammar, it is decidable by a, a PDA. That's what we've just shown today. So back to our Venn diagram that I've erased. Uh, the PDAs, at least just from this result, might appear to be stronger than context-free grammars. But as we mentioned, it turns out you can, the reverse inclusion is also possible, and that will take us uh, quite a bit longer. It also doesn't say anything about this DFA, excuse me, the PDA being minimal in any way or, or, or efficient or anything like that, right? Like, if you were to convert the grammar for the Dick language, right, the Dick language grammar is what? Uh, S goes to S, S, or open S, close, or epsilon. I and we gave a PDA for this and a grammar for this. If you were to convert the PDA to the grammar, though, if you, excuse me, if you were to convert the grammar to the PDA, you would get a, a different looking PDA. So there's no guarantees on minimality or anything like this, or niceness. I mean, this is not a very nice uh, PDA, to be honest. You have one transition with three, seven things on it. That's not concise or clear, but somehow it works, right? Um, right. OK, that's all I have for you today. We proved that the context-free grammars are, uh, every, every context-free language has a PDA. We've proven that every regular language has a PDA. Uh, next time, we'll talk about actually the hardest thing. We'll prove that every, if, every language decidable by a pushed automata has a context-free grammar, kind of involved proof. And we'll also prove that languages decidable by a, we'll also prove that there are non-context-free languages. We'll do like a pumping lemma for context-free grammars. Um, and your exam is also on uh, Tuesday. So, right.